Um, this is a reform church. Yeah, yeah, it's recording, Chairman. Oh my God! You're on Pierce Road, right? Chairman Walsh, it's on. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, everybody, for a slight delay there. We're all set to get started here. Please uh, turn your microphones and pull them up forward. It's on. Can you hear it? Yeah, it's on. Can you hear it now? That might be a bad connection here. Hello, testing. Yeah, yeah. No, that's better. Better? I think there was a loose cable here or something. Okay, okay, Laureen. All right, thank you, everybody. All right, I'd like to call the May 8th, 2023 meeting at Town of Nisky Unit Planning Board and Zoning Commission to order. Uh, Ms. Robertson, or, or who's, who's calling the roll tonight? Yeah, I'll call the roll. Okay. I have um, Chris Laflamme. Here. Michael Scrapitanis. Here. Genghis Khan. Here. David Diarpino. Here. Leslie Gold. Present. Um, Joseph Drescher. Here. Nancy Strang. Here. And Chairman Walsh. Here. And thank you, Laura. Just make some notes here. All right. Um, uh, we've got a couple sets of minutes uh, to approve. First set being uh, from the March 27th, 2023 meeting. Can I have a motion to approve those minutes? I'll move. Uh, okay, move. Thanks to whoever went back and corrected. Okay. Yeah. Moved by Ms. Gold for adoption. Do I have a second? Second. And seconded by Mr. Khan. Any comments or corrections to those minutes? I have none. All those in favor of approval of the minutes from March 27th, 2023, signify by saying aye. 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 Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, March 27th, 2023, minutes are approved. And a new set of minutes, the April 17th, 2023. Can I have a motion to approve those? So moved. Moved by Mr. Scrabby Tennis. I have a second? A second. And second by Mr. Laflam. Uh, questions, comments? I only have one minor. I think we can do a friendly amendment, and that is the. Um, oh, I got. I got to scroll. It's just the attendance. Uh, you state that Mr. Uh, should I got to find it? It's several pages long, as you, everybody knows. Um, somebody was missing, but they were listed as oh, Mr. Drescher, right? They were listed as being present in the, at the top of the of the head. All you got to do is just scratch his name off because it does state that he was uh, uh, absent and excused. Okay, that was the only minor correction I have. For April seventeenth. Yep, that's uh, on April 17th. I think we can just do that with a friendly motion. Is there any other changes to the minutes? I have none either. All those approval of the approval of the minutes from the April 17th, 2023 meeting, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? One abstention myself. I wasn't present. Okay. Um, Likewise. No, uh, Mr. Drescher and Mr. DRPN abstains from those minutes. All right, but the minutes are approved. All right, we have no public hearings. And we're, uh, before we get to the privilege of the floor, uh, I just wanna uh, call the applicant for Mohawk Golf Club forward. Uh, just speaking to the applicant prior to meeting. Um, and uh, I guess we're gonna have a request. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is this microphone on left? I think so, yep. Okay. Uh, in light of the fact that uh, we have the resolution on the agenda this evening, Oh, you know what? It might be Yeah, everyone. Testing. Okay. Better. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In light of the fact that we have the res resolution on the agenda this evening, and at our last meeting on April 17th, we had asked and agreed to have a joint meeting to review TDE comments. Uh, we did not receive those comments until Friday evening at 920. And then we didn't get the planning board packet today until 340 for the meeting tonight at seven o'clock. I'm gonna respectfully request that we are strike from the agenda and set up our meeting that we had talked about at the April 17th meeting and then be back on next planning board agenda. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Sweet. Um, so I'd like to take this out of order because um, 
uh, instead of having privilege of the floor because people might want to leave, but again, everybody's welcome to, to stay and speak regarding any uh, planning and zoning matters. Um, but under new business, we do have a resolution tonight um, for making a recommendation to the town board on the average density development. So um, uh, I'm willing to make a motion that we table um, under new business, the resolution 2023-15, uh, at least until the next meeting, which is May 22nd, which uh, uh, would still give the, us time to make our recommendation to town board since there's really no uh, action to be taken on, uh, uh, from the town board between now and that date. So I'm gonna make a motion that we table the resolution until the May 22, 2023 meeting uh, under um, resolution 2023-15 for the average density development recommendation on Mall Golf Club. Do I have a second? I second. Okay, we have a second, Mr. Scraby Tennis. All those in favor of tabling the resolution? Just one discussion point, if you don't mind, Chairman Wash. Sure. Laura, what time was the packet available to the public? The packet was posted at about 9 p.m. on Friday, Friday night. Yeah. So how does the applicant only get it? At 3:40 today. Um, I, as a courtesy, email applicants reminding them to come to the meeting okay. the day of the. Um, and I didn't use to, but I've been including a link to the packet just so that they're able to access it easily. Um, but it is available to everyone on Friday. Okay. It came Thank out late you. on Friday, though. Thank you, Laura. Okay. Any other comments? And I'm okay with this because it. Uh, uh, it gives another opportunity to review the findings and to get some feedback, which we're, you know, we're open uh, to all feedback. So I don't have a problem with it, putting it off for a couple weeks. Any other discussion or comments? Mr. Chairman, if I might. Yes, sir. I still would like to have the meeting that we all agreed to at the April 17th meeting with the project leaders and the TDE so that we can face-to-face -face discuss those comments. Okay. All right. All right. Um, okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, sec seconded by Mr. Scrabby Tennis. All those in favor of tabling the meeting until uh, tabling the resolution until May 22nd, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, hearing none opposed, it's unanimously uh, agreed to table uh, that resolution for tonight. All right? Thank you. And again, the public will still, we won't have any discussion on Mohawk Golf Club, but we'll still have privilege of the floor, so you still have an opportunity to be heard uh, regarding uh, any comments on the uh, uh, recommendation that was put forth in the package. Okay? All right. All right, so with that said, there is no public hearings tonight, so we will open privilege of the floor. Uh, privilege of the floor is open for any planning and zoning mat matters in the town of Niskayuna. Please come to the microphone. State your name and address for the record, and we'll listen to what you have to say. Hi, my name is Shoshana Bule, and I live at 1119 Ruffner Road. Um, I just want to make a, a quick request about the meeting that has been requested by the applicant for the um, special use permit that was referred to in resolution 2023-15 that's just been tabled and moved to May 22nd. I wanna make sure, I don't understand necessarily the, the attendees for that meeting, but I wanna make it clear that a quorum of this body may not be at that meeting without inviting the rest of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Up by five minutes. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll restart till you get we'll, there. We'll reset the clock. <laughs> okay. Lorene Zabin, 2455 Brookshire Drive. I am a 50 year resident of this town in my home as a taxpayer, as a former employee. And I resent that all of these people that took the time to make the arrangements to get to this meeting, and this gentleman, I didn't get his name, I don't even know whether you know who he is, that he has come to this board and taken the 50 people here and said, oh, go home, we're going to do this in two or three... I think that is rude of the planning board. You're on the agenda. Nobody called to tell the people we are not going to have the resolution tonight. I think it's up to you to care about the people that are here, not just the people that have an application. And this serves them. It doesn't serve us. I have to make provisions 
to get a ride because I don't drive after dark and you don't want me to. The point is that I think that you have done something that I'm very disappointed in. We have come here to tell you, even though you have a resolution, that it is not right that you don't hear their position. Half of these people may not be able to get back on the 22nd. Maybe it's graduation. Who knows what it is? Who knows whether the applicant is going to find another reason not to hear so they have more time to uh, enhance their application? I am really disappointed. According to this, I have three minutes. I'm not going to talk three minutes, but I think you ought to really instead of passing this resolution and telling us all go home and watch TV or something, I think it's wrong. I made an effort to get a driver to bring me here and to see that I get home before dark. And I really, I am so disappointed. You have on, this is on the agenda. I don't know how you can do this. I'd like to ask the attorney if this is legal. Why would we come out if we thought that one person could cancel this whole tribunal here? Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Village of the floor. <laughs> Village of the floor is open. Again, you know, we're, we're listening whether or not the resolution goes forward. You have comments regarding the resolution or Mohawk Golf Club or any any of the items uh, playing zoning, please. Ken, Ken Schwartz, 1360 P. Rucker Court. Two, two points I want to talk about. One point is that um, last, I think it was last meeting, the Postinelli Drive, the two house subdivision, mm -hmm. or two houses he wants to put in there. I listened to that. And they were questioned, I'll be, I'll be kind, they were questioned at length for a great deal of time about the water issue and runoff. They were, and comparatively, the amount of water runoff from that two lot subdivision is infinitesimal to the 1200 foot road the driveways, the roofs, and everything else is going to affect that same road. And I've been up here before telling you about the flood problems on Rao Road. And they haven't heard anything about they, they're going to spec it to the 20-year flood, the 30-year flood, the 50-year flood, the 100-year flood, the 500-year flood. They haven't said anything. All they've said is, hey, we're going to take care of it. Don't worry. Well, when your basement gets flooded, and you go to the town and the town said, hey, it's not our problem. Who the hell has to pay for it? The people sitting here. So I want to make sure that all the dots are, pro are are taken care of correctly. And I, if you use their engineers, their engineers are going to give you the minimum amount that's okay. And whether it's whether it's water runoff on our road, whether it's the sewer, you know, you, Everybody up here has complained about a lot of different things. And they have come back and they have said nothing. Everybody's been talking, second point, been talking, and they've all brought up excellent issues. None of them have been addressed satisfactorily. All I've heard is that, hey, if we get our approval, we're going to do it all. That's smoke and mirrors. That's like buying software that doesn't exist. Where's the proof? How can you approve something? If you don't have any real answers, that's all. Because I think it's embarrassing for everybody here to come up and say the same thing over and over again. I would love to know what the process is. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Give him hell. All right, my name is uh, Norman Schilling. I reside at... Uh, 1400 Rao Road. The topic I'm going to talk about is again Antonio. Um, let's see, and uh, 
and specifically uh, about, uh, well, stormwater again, okay? This is my happy place to talk about stormwater. I read through the um, PDE report uh, and was uh, very impressed. And in particular, I found that uh, there are a lot of issues there that we've talked about before and that we brought up. One in particular I'd like to talk about is uh, detention and specifically underground detention that was uh, mentioned in the PDE report. Um, kind of when you have underground detention, it's hard to detect if anything's wrong. You don't see it happen or you don't see that it's failed until it actually happens. In a way, it's kind of analogous to having a crash meter on your car, right? The crashes happen a little too late. Okay, we've got ponding. Now we got a problem. Now we've got the, you know, the potential to go through a lot of clearance, a lot of re uh, renovation and the cleaning. Uh, I have a pump system in my house and I have an annual maintenance every year. And you wouldn't believe what gets into that, all right? Not only do I get silt, I get biofouling. I also wind up getting bugs. God knows how they get in there. But nevertheless, the operations and maintenance is going to be a key issue. Who does it? Who's responsible for that? You know, once you, know, once you have a problem, you know, this may be five, ten years out. May not even be the same people who own the homes in the first place. So the operations and maintenance, who's responsible, who's going to be looking out to see what kind of state that the uh, detention uh, under the stormwater detention is. So the second topic I want to talk about is rainfall. All right. We've had a lot of that lately. But uh, going through, I went through the, uh, again, the first submittal that was made by Steambaugh on uh, water and, and precipitation. And we've been arguing back and forth. What is the right level of precipitation ought to be used in the design? What I did is I took a look at, I went to the same resource, the Cornell, it's the Cornell uh, Regional Climate Center. And uh, they have tables. You can go, it's a very easy website to go to to get data on precipitation level. What I found uh, from the original application was, this is it, it says here, uh, here are the numbers that are for the, uh, the two-year, the 10-year, and the 100-year, and the under the title Extreme Precipitation Estimates. This is what was in the, uh, in the, in the, in the original report of, or the proposal. When I went to that website, what I come up with, putting in the same exact data, I come up with, no, that's not extreme precipitation. If the numbers show up that are used in the analysis mean precipitation. Now, let me ask you, would you want to get on an airplane where the designer says, hey, all the materials, all the bolts, all the panels have been designed to the average, the average strength, tensile strength, or corrosion resistance of the material. Would you want to get on that plane? No, I wouldn't want to get on that plane at no cost. So I think the issue is what do you use? I think you have to look out to what's going to happen in the future. I made out one uh, point I made in my last discussion or presentation was it's getting worse. So 100 year is not going to be 100 year anymore. Point I want to make here is that I think as you're going through the table, when you go to Cornell to the precipitation center, you go down to the 100 year estimates for the lower limit. That's probability less than 10% or 5% of this happening. It's more likely over the next couple of years that probability is going to increase. So what do you get? The way Stingbau and I guess the original assessment was, it was about six inches to be expected over a 24-hour period. If you raise that to a confidence level of 90%, it's 7.44 inches. That's a significant difference. And I think as you're going through with the TDE and further discussion that you want to point out that to get a little bit of safety factor into this, let's take a look further out and really use what we have, the best data we have now. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Charles Horowitz. I live at 1223 Rothner Road. Uh, I, I'm speaking tonight because I'm, I'm not sure if I'll be able to be here on the 22nd. I'm not happy that it was postponed. Uh, first, I want to urge you to reject the special use permit, okay? Uh, secondly, uh, I had adequate time to 
review the entire packet that went out on Friday. And I had the weekend to review it and run over the whole thing. And I want to refer to page 122 of the packet. There was the planning board findings, page eight of 10. And this had to do with the street layout. Now in previous meetings, I have spoken to you about the impact of this project and particularly the road uh, on my neighbor's property, uh, 1219, and my, my property, mine and my wife's property at 1223. And I talked about how for my neighbor, he was suddenly going to have three streets going around his property. Now, I, I just mentioned it as I did right now, but he addressed that point much more eloquently. And I supported what he had to say. I was very happy to see that in the planning board findings, they concluded that that situation created an unforeseen hardship for my neighbor at 1219. Where I was unhappy is that you did not include my property and my wife's property at 1223 because what I had previously said was that there was no property that I saw in Rosendale in my neighborhood where a road was installed that had not been planned 50, 60 years after the house was built. And that the way the property, the way that the project was arranged, the, uh, the, the unit that, that the Mohawk Club is presenting has that unit closest to my property than any of the units that are being built along that stretch. In addition, the road hooks around so as to miss, uh, so as to uh, uh, create a situation where they don't have to change the green. And so I have cars going by very close to my property with their headlights coming right into my bedroom, which is on the the first, first floor, the ground floor. So I would like that statement in A2 to be amended to include my property and to state that that is also, it is an unforeseen hardship, 34 years unforeseen to the property at 1223 as well. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jim Dillon. I live at 1242 Ruckner Road. And I'm disturbed by the fact that the applicant for this proposal probably is going to meet and come up with a plan that's going to deal with all the technical stuff. Maybe they can do that. From reading it, I don't know how they're going to do that. But the point I want to raise, it can be lost in all the details of this. Going back to the original intent of the applicant has been to put in their proposal and to put it forth in a way that would have zero impact on their golf course. Our neighborhood had to absorb all the impact. They wanted to do it so they absorbed nothing I just don't understand how when someone puts forth a proposal that impacts a second party, that they could have the audacity to want to put all the burden on the party that, that didn't propose it in the first place. First, they wanted to knock down a house so that it wouldn't touch one inch of the golf course. When that was rejected, then they put in the next one. If you look at how much of the golf course is being impacted, it's minimal. Instead, they take this road that goes out of their way to run behind a house to have three roads on the other side. And if you go down Ruffner Road and you stop, and I recommend everyone do that, if you stop between that house and the other house and look at where that proposed road is supposed to go, I, I ask you to park there and look at that spot and look at those trees. They're beautiful trees. When you ride down Ruffner Road, that really adds a lot to our neighborhood, that green space and those trees. They want to cut them all down and put on a road. 
So unless they come forward with something where they share the burden or impact, let them come forth and say, yeah, we're going to change this green or we're going to change this hole. Are they going to do that? I doubt it very much. So I would ask you to really look closely and listen to everything they say and look for a degree of fairness. If they come forward again, ask them what sacrifices are they willing to make rather than put them all on our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Lombardo, 1242 Ruffner Road. We've all been here for months. Fall turned into winter, winter turned into spring, and here we are. And spending hours and hours and hours reading all the materials you've sent on the computer and reviewing all the videotapes of everything. And I appreciate that we get all that and transcribing everything. And and I guess two things that, that just keep echoing in my head that, that were said months and months ago, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And there doesn't really seem to be any reasonable way out of there. And in looking at the resolution, the, the comments that were made, yes, they make sense. They make sense. It's not a good spot. It is not a good spot. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody? Oh. My name is Mark Thomas, and I reside at 1265 Ruffner Road. And I have with me here a letter from the Audubon Society of the Capital Region, hereafter referred to as ASCR. And the letter is dated May 3rd, 2023, and addressed to the town of Nisuna Planning Board at One Nisuna Circle. Dear Chairman Walsh and members of the Planning Board, the Audubon Society of the Capital Region would like to thank you for providing the opportunity to comment on the proposed special use permit for a 22 lot average density development subdivision, ADD, of single family homes and townhomes in the 14 acre parcel of land owned by the Mohawk Golf Club. ASCR, Audubon Society of the Capital Region, strongly opposes approval of the ADD and subsequent development of this parcel for the following reasons. Number one, deforestation and development of the area will destroy the habitat of resident and migrating wildlife, particularly birds. The area is a mixed successional forest that includes mature coniferous trees and deciduous trees, including shagbark, hickory, and oak trees, which provide places for birds to build their nests and raise their young. The trees also house insects, the larvae of which feed the nesting birds that breed there. Number two, ASCR understands that this parcel is a wetland, which is critical to the health of the ecosystem in the area. Since wetlands filter rainwater and snow to provide clean, water for human and animal consumption. Wetlands also support aquatic wildlife, which is part of the delicate balance of the property. Creation of new structures will alter vegetation and indirectly impact existing high quality habitat. Number three, building impervious surfaces such as paved roads, patios, driveways, and homes will cause stormwater runoff to become more concentrated in a time of increasing severe weather events 
caused by climate change. ASCR recommends that the Mohawk Golf Club administration consider other portions of its property for a subdivision development that will have less impact on the area's ecosystem in accordance with the town of Niskayuna's comprehensive plan and that the town board will carefully consider such a dramatic change to an existing land use. Sincerely, Teresa Murphy, President, Carol Quantuck, Vice President, Audubon Society of the Capital Region. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Laura, did you get oh did you get a copy of that letter? Yes, I did. It's also emailed to you. Yep. Okay. okay. Is that today today? Just just yeah. Must have been later. Yep. Okay. Anybody else privilege of the floor? Excuse me, Rosie, eleven eighty four Hedgewood Wayne. Um, along with, with the gentleman, may I want to pull that microphone down a little bit, oh, sir? Yes, sir. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, along with what the gentleman said earlier, it appears to be a one way street here. Uh, the developer, there's no hardship for the developer. He has over 200 acres there. And to, as the plan he's proposing to ask for a special use permit, you know, there's no hardship. If the town grants this as submitted, it's just creating. Uh, a negative effect for that section of the town because this isn't the first development. It'll be another phase and another phase. Unfortunately, the golf course will probably not be there in another 10 years, regardless of what's been said. So why can't they use the other partial of the land? Why can't they share some of the burden also by allowing in, in, ingress and egress from two areas uh, Low density, the way the rules are, follow the rules that are here. Because I feel if uh, it's granted as submitted, we're, you're going to create a Pandora's box here. As sure as I'm standing here, there's going to be another development soon here within the next couple of years. There's nothing wrong with the development, but development according to the rules. You'll set a precedence here, and it'll be a negative effect on that part of the town. I expect we request that the board consider that and reject it as submitted. It's not a it's a two life's a two way street. You got to give and take. Either you want to run a golf course or you want to do a housing development. That's that's what I want them to consider. And I think you should bear that mind in your decision. It's gotta be a two way street, like the gentleman said here. You can't put all the burden on the town. Please consider that, and I respectfully request that the town board consider that and that decision to reject this plan as submitted. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Privilege of the floor. Any planning and zoning matters? Uh, Dr. Fantasi, 1397 Rowe Road. I live at the bottom of the proposed, uh, whatever you want to call it there, put in a couple of houses up there. I've watched this whole thing develop over all this time. The, I was the second person to move into that area. The first night I was there, none of my friends here lived around there yet. Uh, my whole side of the one part of my house was a went right down into the Pulsinelli Drive. So the next day, the guys had to come in and, and bring everything back up the sump. And I've been dealing with, with this water thing for, for 37 years. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, about uh, I've lived there about 10 years, I started having pro problems in my basement. And then... Uh, I find out that you know the water is not just going down. All that water comes down that hill, comes up toward the house. So, well, fortunately, I had a brother who's got all the equipment. He got rid of a lot of the soil around that place because it's all clay. And we put stone in there, 
and that took care of the problems. We patched up this, the, the, the problem in the cellar, and I've been getting along just great. And I get along just great by diverting all the water. I was taught right from that day, you cannot stop this water, but you can divert it. So I have it running around my house, down over the hill, down into the houses these people had to go across their lawns. Those lawns were all built up. That area was very low. And uh, the second year I lived there, I heard a lot of noise across the street where these people live now. I got over there, there were three houses with the foundations, three feet of water in each one of them. And I talked to the builder, who got to be a friend of mine. He's going crazy, trying he and his sons to get everything out of that creek. And as time's gone on, it's just gotten better and wetter. And nobody's looking, but part of that side of the north side of that uh, piece of property is kind of eroding. It is it's, you know, it's disappearing. The problem is, you know, we've been here. There's a lot of people in my neighborhood have been hurt by this and they had to pay the money to get their basements and all this stuff under control well, we shouldn't have to do that in other words the problem is water the question is what are you guys going to do about this thing it only gets worse and uh, it's, it's it's not going to get better i don't think i talked to mr falsinelli about what his plans are Probably could do, do 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 that if he had to, but he's got to do something about the water. Nobody wants to address this thing. That's why this this this, this whole area got slowed down. They had they had all kinds of things they wanted to do there. They can't do them because they got to deal with the water. So if they're going to let these guys put up a couple houses. I mean, I I'm right in their line coming down here. They got to do something about this water. Because what I'm doing about the water is diverting it. I run it around my house and down the hill, goes across the street, goes into the creek, goes into other people's lawns and everything else. And that's the only thing you can do about it. So hopefully they'll finally come to the point here that they, you know there's just so much development you can do without dealing with the water. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Doug McFadden. I live at 1880 Row Road. I've been, been in front of the, this uh, zoning commission and planning board many times. Um, what I'm concerned about is I just saw that the uh, comments from the TDE on this two house project, many, many comments, many, many questions. And I guess what I'm wondering is how all that's going to be addressed. And we're going to get this project approved apparently by the end of this month. I, I don't. I think that's a very advanced schedule, and I think that's what the plan is here. So I hope when we that the TDA and Mr. Steenberg get together and we we get some questions questions and comments addressed, because I he's got a lot of work to do. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Any planning and zoning matters? Anything? You can come up again, sure. Now, do we have anybody online, Laura, or any? Uh, uh... There is one person online. Okay. First of all, when people get up to speak, if they speak into the microphone, then I can hear you because I know you have some wonderful things to say, and I do have the ability to get uh, hearing aids here. I want to tell you that a few years ago, we had 12 acres of prime property across the street from the Mohawk Mall. And the only reason why I want to bring this up is because the planning board, I don't know how many times the applicant came in to readjust the application. I remember residents 
It had nothing to do with the school board because the taxes went to the South Colony School. But the property tax would go to, according to the planning board, would go to Niskiuna. And the only reason I wanted to bring this history up, because I don't think anybody was there except maybe Ms. Gold, the fact remains that once the land is gone, you're not going to get it back. Once you have your housing developments and your change of property things, and uh, the kids graduate from the high school that they seem to think they need, then we are left with what we're left with. I'm not sure that the town of Niskayuna with its 14 square acres, that's all. We're not gonna get any more land. We have a few farms left. Some of them are probably gonna go in for zone change. But I want the people that are here, I may not be here May 22nd, and it doesn't make any difference because I don't live in that neighborhood. I drove around that whole neighborhood today and I saw the beautiful homes, the landscaping. Yeah, some of the grass needed cutted. Some of the roads are not even the standard road. Some of the roads were smaller in my estimation. I want to tell you that this applicant, and I think the Mohawk Club has been an asset to the town, don't get me wrong. I think that they are have become a separate, very selfish, money-grabbing institution. They have a, a beautiful golf course. They have a renowned benefit. I had my 50th wedding anniversary there. Don't tell me that they are in need of developing 14 square acres to the detriment of the people that have already lived there. Now, the fact that you're not doing this, you're not recommending it is, is wonderful, but the town board is not to be trusted. And I think that these people are being led down a, a, a very dangerous path because the 12 acres of the Stanford property across the street from the Mohawk Mall, I don't think that was recommended either. And I remember the supervisor at the time, his board approved it five, four or five times the applicant had changed the application. I'm not sure that the, the present a planner was here at the time. It could have been someone else. But the fact remains that the people that live here have to have a voice, regardless of what the comprehensive plan says, because at the time of the comprehensive plan, it probably was not in their, their view that something like this could happen that would impact where they live. I, live, I don't live there. I live over in the Avon Crest area. The fact remains that these people bought houses, I don't know how old the development is, not quite 50 years, 42 years, 40 years. They didn't envision when they bought the house that there could be some invasion of what they thought was a solid single family development. I do think that we can't always go by what was. We have to think about what's coming as I believe the last speaker was very, he's, he's absolutely right on. But when you're dealing with the acreage of one applicant versus many applicants, Every one of these people that live there is an applicant against this one, almost. I only want to tell you that when we bought a house here, and I think a lot of you feel the same way, it was because of the town. It's a wonderful town. It was a wonderful town. The few little historical things that are left, the... Uh, uh, train station is one that's being hopefully retained. 
but the the little one school full uh, uh, schoolroom on Rosendale Road, we can thank the historian for preserving that. I only want to give you a little history. I know you've made your recommendation, and it was a good one. But now to have to go and fight the town board, which not always has the best known candidates that sit there. They don't know the history. We already have Lorraine, one town board. Lorraine, you're going to need to summarize, please, okay? We have one town board member who can't even vote on the project. But that doesn't mean that the other town board members, they may not have the history or the love of this town that those of us have paid taxes for 100 years practically. I just want them to know that the best thing that a resident and a taxpayer can do is not always think of what's going to benefit the applicant. It's one, one that's going to hurt our town. It's a town problem. We, we've got to start to think about the basic town and the need here. And this is a good start, and I thank the planning board for not recommending this. But I also think that the residents have to now start to be very careful when it goes to the town board and they take it up. They are no longer okay. connected to the planning board. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you very much. Uh, I see you. Is it um, is good online? Is she look, looking to speak? Yeah. Is there anyone online who wishes to speak? I waive my time. Okay. Anybody here who wishes to speak before I close privilege of the floor? Any letters, Laura? Emails received? Um, I did get an email from Margaret Corey and then also from the Audubon Society. Okay. And the email from Ms. Corey was regarding uh, Tolson, uh, the uh, Antonia Park subdivision? Um, I believe it was the Mohawk Golf Club. Okay, but we'll get a copy of that, right? So. Yeah, that one was also emailed just very shortly before the meeting. Okay. All right, we'll take a look at those, and they'll be included in the minutes. Anybody else? All right, seeing, hearing no one, I'm going to close privilege of the floor. Thank you. We have no unfinished business tonight. And as you know, under new business, we uh, tabled the resolution to next meeting uh, regarding the average density development. So we're going to move right into discussion. And discussion uh, only discussion item tonight is on Antonia Park, Tolsonelli subdivision. Um, and the applicant and applicant's engineer, I see, is here. And um, Laura, do we have a TDE for this uh, here for this? Uh, um, he's not here tonight. We did set up a meeting with him. Here's a meeting set up? Or we were trying. We're trying. We're trying. trying. OK. So I'll just give it one second, if you don't mind, let everybody go, and then we'll. Uh... <laughs> okay. What? Uh, please keep moving. We'll have to. We have a meeting in progress. Please. Excuse me. You like this? Yeah. <laughs> we'll get there. All right. All right. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Brett Steenberg, engineer for the applicant, um, Fred uh, Polsonelli, um, in the Antonia Drive Two Lot Subdivision. I'm going to keep this very brief because at this point we're working through technical issues with Prime Engineering. Um, as far as rainfall, there, there was one thing that I appreciate that he did point out regarding um, the piping short circuiting um, with the way the piping simple fix. It's really just a matter of separating out the piping with some drains. And look, I, I, we'd like to sit down and speak with them about the, the, the dry swales. The driveways are too steep for specific dry swell. That's why we did the gravel just to talk through some of these these points, because I think it's good to get in a room and at least go through them just so we can come up with the best possible solution and make sure that, you know, our mitigation measures are the, to, to the, to the maximum extent practical 
on that site because of the historic drainage issues um, in that culvert under Rao Road. Um, we did, you know, sharpen the pencil as uh, Mr. Khan had requested and, and actually reduce those numbers a little bit more. But of course, there, there's some still some back and forth we're going to need with with Doug Cole and Prime Engineering. But I don't anticipate that to take more than a meeting. I'd like to get um, actually town engineer uh, Inc. staff in on that meeting as well, because there is the question regarding the sewer issues. And I, I did speak with Matt briefly about that. And I know they've completed their study and there, there is some data out there, which I think is going to be beneficial for allowing us to connect, but I think he needs to make that determination. Um, so I'd like to get him in on him or, or um, um, uh, his name is escaping me down, Dan, um, in on that meeting uh, so that we can at least have the most productive meeting possible, come back to you with final plans, final answers that uh, hopefully is something that, that this board uh, feels comfortable with. Yeah, the only, um, uh, Ms. Gold, do you have anything, Ms. Gold? Not really, because I am waiting to see how this plays out between the engineers. Yep. Yeah. No. Since I'm not one, I'm not going to offer an opinion. <laughs> no, and as uh, you know, as you heard from the public tonight, and, and yeah, and that's where we're, we're all at, right? Now we all want to make sure we're in agreement and that we get buy off from the town designated engineer that what the proposal is going to work and that uh, the problem. Uh, doesn't get any worse and hopefully uh, there's some improvement as a result of the uh, uh, design that's uh, put forth. I think um, you're talking about uh, sheet C4 details. Uh, the only thing I'd just like to mention is it said that uh, it's not a standard practice, I guess what you're doing. So that's one of the things that you need to sit down and kind of work through. Actually, um, we probably won't be doing, I shouldn't say we won't be doing any standard practices on the site. The site doesn't, the, the, the magnitude of the development on the site doesn't drive this to these standard practices by the New York State Small Market Design Manual. Um, what I'm trying to propose as far as the design is what works best for the site. And the reason the, the standard practices in the New York State Stormwater Design Manual, they, they're they all been put forth to try to offer water quality and water quantity um, attenuation. Our main focus on this site, I mean, we're offering quite a bit of water quality um, through the stone filtration and such, even though it's not a standard practice. But our main focus has been water quantity and, and that, that volume of runoff off the site. So that's why I proposed a, a, a non-standard practice because I felt it offered a better solution for that. A lot of the water quality devices, bioretention ponds uh, being one of them, don't actually offer a attenuation or water quantity. Usually you pair something with that. Like the Iroquois, all the all the bioretention basins at Iroquois Village, uh, the apartments off Hillside Avenue, they actually have a a deep stone layer underneath that. You'll see about six inches above the water bottom of that basin. There's a stone trench. When the water reaches, which is your water quality volume, that six inches, it flows into that basin. It's attenuated with underdrain before it leaves the site. We designed that. It's been working excellent. Um, to to the best of my knowledge, I've heard no complaints. Every time I go by it, it seems to be working. Um, great. The vegetation is growing. They look good. Um, but that that was a combination of a standard practice and a non-standard practice to meet what we felt is the the, the critical um, areas. And so the design that I put forth is something that is, is considered a non-standard practice. We can look at um, some standard practices, but the standard practices that are they're focused on attenuation, um, the only one that would be one of the only ones that would be applicable are infiltration practices, which we can't do because we're in hard pan uh, soils at that depth. Um, and a pocket pond, which is under five acres of disturbance. All the other larger uh, detention ponds and stormwater wetlands and such, therefore five to 10 acres of disturbance areas, you can see the magnitude. So we're looking at this on a much smaller scale and looking at something that is specifically designed for the site. So that's why you, you're you're hearing that, and that's something we'll be reviewing, you know, thoroughly with Mr. Cole, and and going over with, you know, how this design is is played out through the through the process. And the only other comment that I have is the uh, uh, concerns about, you know, the operations and maintenance of whatever right. uh, uh, system is invoked to be able to uh, make the site workable. And uh, I don't know if that's something that's, uh, you know, by resolution, whether it's included in the deed, whether, you know, it's nice that they're included, but if nobody knows it's there, well, like you say, when the property is sold or get moves down, we want to make sure that uh, you don't have to answer it now, but we want to make sure that there's a, a, a linkage or a, uh, 
some kind of transition so that it's visible somehow. And, and that's um, actually Mr. Polsonelli and I were discussing that. And we, we would like to defer till we have, actually have the meeting with the engineers. But that's something he is very concerned about as well, because that involves the sellability of the lots. If people are looking at these lots saying, yeah. oh, my God, what am I going to have to spend $100,000 in two years to fix the it scares people because it's unknown. And, and we're trying to make this something that that the residents can maintain and yet will function to what we need it to function to attenuate the flows off site to, to, to try to help some of the problems. So in other words, have a design that has very little or no maintenance. <laughs> there aren't a lot of designs that have very little or no maintenance, unfortunately. That would be ideal, um, obviously. But, but the, we're, 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 we're keeping our options open and um, you know, trying to think outside the box a little bit with possible designs that may work better, that may have a little bit easier maintenance. It's it's something we're looking at as we're going through the process, just because we don't want to inundate homeowners, and then we don't also don't want designs and, right. and systems out there that are failing because they haven't been maintained. All right. And it's uh, if I recall, it's two four, four acre parcels, correct? Somewhere it's in two or four acre parcels. And yeah. how about the? Uh, or three acre parcels. two three acre yeah. but the actual uh, area of a disturbance you have a number that you've been utilizing uh, approximately I, I, I don't quote me it's less than an acre but i think it's about three quarters of an acre of disturbance total for the two houses so that's another thing too we also need to incorporate any approvals is that if you know if we're basing uh, all the uh, design criteria on disturbance we want to make sure that that's somehow captured in any approval if it does yep. occur okay yeah absolutely right. which yeah. you know so and i think we really need to start figuring out how we're going to record the maintenance requirements for these systems. Um, I was at one neighborhood in town and they've got a problem and all they know is the town says it's not the town's responsibility, but no one of them owns the land and they don't know how to fix the problem. They know what the problem is. They just don't know who's got the authority to do it. And I don't think you have an answer to that. Um, I'm talking to Pond Schwaber. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, it needs work, and they don't know who's supposed to do it. Yeah. And I don't know what to tell them. Yeah. Tell them to call the highway department. I, I they called somebody that. and were told that it was in the town's responsibility. I would. I don't know all, but I would believe so, that would be a town maintained facility, given the time that that subdivision was installed and the type of practice that's out there, I would think that would have been turned over from Amador to the town. So basically, so. They, they need to have the line cleaned out and they don't know who can authorize doing it. No, and who pays for it. And the, <laughs> so this it, is this isn't a new problem specific to this unit. It's all over. Um, yeah, we've got other developments. We're talking about how to handle stormwater management who's going to maintain it, who's going to own it. It's become a bigger, it's, and especially in these situations where you have small lots and houses where you're not conveying stormwater management to a municipality who owns it, who maintains that. Uh, deed restrictions seem to be the, the go-to thing on that, where you have a deed restriction that you are to maintain your stormwater management in perpetuity while you own the, the property. Um, but this is not something that's an easy, um, an easy answer that I can say, hey, do this, because every town is wrestling with this because the, the, the practices are getting smaller. Um, it used to only be, you know, when we designed subdivisions, you had one large practice, everything went to that one large practice, the town went in, they maintained it, got turned over to the town as part of their storm sewers. That's not the case anymore because individual lots are now more and more and more having these bioretention basins, rain gardens, various types of, of stormwater management practices that, that need to be maintained for the, the length of the, and it's, it's, it's a good question. Um, I think probably deed restrictions and the inclusion of that, um, the, the maintenance plan um, with the sale of the homes is probably the, the best thing that I've seen thus far, um, short of HOAs, but an HOA would never work on a two loss subdivision. So that's out of the question. Okay. All right, so it sounds like an engineering meeting between the uh, town designated engineer and uh, the applicant. Yep. And obviously invite Ms. Gold uh, at the meeting. Um, and, you know, keep me on carbon copy if I can make it out also stop in. But um, okay. once you work through it, then we'll be looking for, uh, I guess, a response from the town. Does I know you responded to their... Uh, I haven't responded to the most recent the, set of comments, yeah. but we, I would like to actually meet and go through them. And, and it looks, and I will say, you know, 
hearing that there's a lot of comments. It looked like a lot of comments. A lot of them were the applicant said this. This this issue is closed. The applicant they they kept all the original yeah. comments from the original letter in there. So it wasn't quite as much as it looked on paper. It was rather shocking looking through it, scrolling through it on my phone when I first got it. Um, but going through it line by line, there isn't as much there. It's really just getting us all in the room and saying, hey, do you think this will work better? I mean, I'm I'm open to suggestions from other engineers and TDEs. I, I love to work with them. It's 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 great for uh, collaboration to come up with good ideas. Um, usually, you end up with the best product at the end. That's what we'd like to do. So. Uh, 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 so, sorry, you yeah. discarded. I was going to suggest an HOA. Why did you discard the HOA? I know two units is small, but two units is small. Um, just the cost of putting an HOA together, and then the maintenance cost of an HOA. It, 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 what it would end up being are two, two, because you'd have to have one person in charge and one person not in charge. And I think if you had two homes and an HOA, the one person would always be. It, it would be fighting between the two residences, whereas. When you have a larger HOA, you have a board, much like you have in any any government setting. Um, this, I think, you'd have more of a Hatfield McCoy type of situation where you're going to have, hey, I'm not doing this, I'm not paying that. I, I just I don't see it functioning in the long term. Is there a common interest ownership structure that you can envision? Could you do? I'm talking out loud here. Yeah. Two hundred um, condominium. I'm just. Could there be something so there'd be joint ownership? short of an HOA? I'm thinking how shared driveways are handled, and I'm not 100% certain. I'm, I'm not a real estate attorney, so I don't have that information. I work with a lot of real estate attorneys. I don't, I don't, I haven't, I haven't seen this on this scale. Let's, right. I so, that. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's such a small scale. I think, I, I really think the deed restriction is probably going to be the and we're also going to be looking in this meeting at practices that are a little more open and visible and easy, easier to maintain because what will end up happening, um, deed restrictions historically are they're, um, they're policed by the neighbors. So when the neighbors realize that they're, the, if there's a stormwater basin that's visible and can be seen or something, that, that they're seeing water running down the road, then they call the town and then the town doesn't want to get involved and they shouldn't get involved because it's a deed restriction, but at least the notice is sent out that, hey, listen, you own this property as part of your deed. Then it becomes a, then it becomes a civil matter. I'm, I, and the only reason I know this is I'm going through this on a 19 lot subdivision in Clifton Park right now where we're talking all through this, these issues as well. Okay. Can you just, Laura, one question. Does Mr. Cole in Prime Engineering does is he does he have an informed understanding of what the whole water situation is historically in the railroad area? So Clark has been talking with him regularly, and so I would say, generally speaking, yes. Um, Clark makes sure that um, all of the discussions and comments that we get from the neighbors are passed on, and has been working really hard with them so that he understands what the existing drainage situation is. Um, I think one of the common thread comments is providing a little more detailed calculations and showing the work. I know that's very important to Clark. Like he really wants to be able to follow like where the water falls, how it's being sized on the roof, where that volume's going into the trenches, like how the, like showing the work of the numbers is very important. Yeah, we have a tendency to like, that's all in the HydroCAD calculations and pretty thoroughly feed it in the HydroCAD calculations. Um, it's probably one of the, it is, almost it's really the industry standard when, when we're talking about um, uh, storm water and open channel flow um, but we can at least pull that information out and show them you know hey you know what i've done in the past is you know where you have some of these uh, stage storage tables with the attenuation areas you can pull it out and say hey see what as this fills up you can see it fills up we're reaching this orifice or outlet and it's starting to drain now you're seeing this and this is how much is draining out it, it's it's it, it, but once you when you package it up in that 75 page report or whatever that we submitted it kind of gets lost in that appendix and we can easily pull that out and go over everything and again a, a meeting with everyone i think to find out exactly what they're looking for would be beneficial so you're saying actually it was already in the stormwater management report that 
You yeah, submitted? That's all, that's all within the hydrocap calculations. Okay, but the detail of that calculation is still invisible to the reader of the report, right? Uh, yes and no. I mean, you're not there saying, okay, the Mannings, mm -hmm. the Mannings calculation and going down through the, the calculation yeah. like you would on a piece of paper, but the, 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 the software is utilizing the, the Mannings calculation, the Mannings mm -hmm. number, mm -hmm. and the slope, and all of that is, is all calculated in there, and that's where you're getting these. Um, okay, but maybe if Clark wants to see that detail, we probably should. I, I can, I'd be yeah. happy to work with yeah. yeah. him. It comes up multiple times. He really does want to see the detail. Yeah. And the other thing that he brings up is like, we see this at the planning board a lot. Like the calculations that you're using are for a model home, which is understandable. You don't have a building permit for a single family home. But it is a very rare to almost non existent condition that a building permit is submitted for a home that's less to less than or equal to the size of what is shown on the subdivision plot. And so I know another thing that he wanted to understand is like the scalability, because if everything's being calculated on a 2000 or well, like, I don't know, a thousand five hundred square foot roof, but then we get a building permit for a large three acre lot, you know, with like a, you know, almost 3000 square foot. I mean, they happens. <laughs> Yeah, so like, like yeah. we get really concerned that this is this is scaled too small, possibly for what a building permit can happen. And and I agree. I, I know these footprints are rather large on on this. I, I didn't I didn't put them on there, there but they are large footprints. Uh, I I think, I, and I, I very much agree. Um, you know, I've been on both sides of the table. I've done PD work. I've done design work. Um, it's it's a tough thing to you I kind of almost have to look at it from impact to you know you go to a side load garage and I got to turn around or something like that it does it adds when you're looking at it on a grand scale 30 lot subdivision at the end of the day it doesn't change much at all it, it, I I've done I've done the numbers I've calculated it it almost never changes anything on this micro scale where we're looking at it on a two lot subdivision which is very mm -hmm. small. It, it will change those numbers. Um, I don't anticipate that it's going to change real world, the runoff at the end of the day, because everything is based on data. So when, when I'm looking at the stone storage, typical stone storage, the amount of volume uh, within stone, crushed stone or, or number three stone put in the ground is 40% of that area is available for water storage. Is it 40 percent? Is it 45? Typically, they, they tend to 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 err on the side of caution. And, that, and with most of what I do, yeah. I tend to err on the side of caution. Um, again, there's a lot of things that that go into it. I think real world at the end of the day, you probably wouldn't notice a difference, but it should be modeled as close as we can get it to what is. Yeah, so, so is it worth doing that? Whatever the X percent increase study is. And, and look, let me, you know, let me make a statement here, right? The. This is an engineering problem, very, very different from some of the other things that are currently in our agenda, right? So there's an engineering problem to be solved here and the combination of assumptions and the calculations, how the calculations are done, right? The, the, the tables and handbooks, et cetera, that are used, right, play a key role. So I, I know it takes money and time, Mr. Falsinelli, I understand that, right? But at the end of the day, we know that we're dealing with an area that just is on the precipice of being real bad for a whole bunch of people, right? If we get it wrong. And so the key thing is if there's an extra calculation or two or three or four that can be done prior to, you know, some sensitivity, right? You know, maybe lower, lower, you know, collectively what the X percent increases when a house comes to get building permit, right? To build just to show those sensitivities, right? I mean, I'm not telling you to do it, but I'm just saying, you know, to at least make sure that we've got a robust engineering solution with what is being offered. And Mr. Khan, the, the one thing with this project and the, the town has in their requirements that if there is a sensitive area, you can require a drainage study. That's actually where we're at. This project in any other situation other than the town of Colony, which has it in their regulations that any uh, area over a certain square footage that's disturbed, I think it's 5,000 square feet, requires a full drainage analysis. It's the only town I've other, other I've run into that in. Um, this wouldn't even be, 
we wouldn't even be talking really about drainage or putting this amount of emphasis on attenuating drainage and runoff for a two lot subdivision, which are two houses and driveways. And I'm not saying that we're wrong in doing that because there is, there's a historical problem. Um, but what I do want to say is there's still a, under the current conditions, there's a significant quantity of water. I shouldn't say significant. There is a quantity of water leaving the site in the baseline conditions. It's, it's what we call the existing conditions. Mm -hmm. And what you're, what you're looking at when you do a drainage study is a differential between your runoff curve numbers. And if this site were sand with trees, would have a runoff curve number of 39. It's not sand. It's clays and silts. So the runoff curve number is much higher. I think it's somewhere in the 80s. The runoff curve number for a um, paved, paved parking lot, roof, water surface, anything that's impermeable is 98. So what you're looking at is the, 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 mm -hmm. the amount of runoff is, is variable on a sliding scale between those two. So when you look at a sand area that's 39, and then you're going to put a paved parking lot on it you get a huge differential in that overall runoff curve number. In this, there is not a huge differential, but we are taking that, what, what, what is that differential and putting it into an attenuation basin. Um, and it, the, the magnitude of the difference isn't as extreme as you think it is, or is initially you think it is because you're not saying, hey, I'm putting 500 more square foot on my garage. I'm putting a, a, a third bay on the garage. It's got 500 more square feet. All that water is going to end up in the storm sewer. That's not the case. It's it's a, it's a it's portion a, it's a, of that. Yeah. And so maybe coming back to the request that Clark had, right? Maybe I think if Clark's able to see some of the detail, maybe yeah. we can, you know, heuristically understand what it is. We slide up. One, one other last thing. The gentleman in Privilege of the Floor mentioned the usage of the from the Cornell precipitation tables, the usage of the mean versus the the extreme. Yeah. So which one was it? The, the mean. We we've always used the mean. Every in the probably twenty municipalities I've worked in in the last um, five years, because that's when we started really using that data okay. because it came readily available. Um, has accepted and utilized that as well as the TDs as every other engineer I've known that I've worked with has been either utilizing that or um, the tables out of which are very, very difficult to read and very imprecise um, off of the uh, TR-55 mm -hmm. um, The only town that deviates from that, again, is the town of Colony. They have their own set of standards that they've written for stormwater management, um, but the mean <clears throat> precipitation Yes, there's a there's a lower frequency. You can pull it up on Cornell Cooperative Extension. I love the website. You pick you pick the site. Yep. It tells you data specific to that site based upon the, the data interpolations. Um, there's a lower uh, um, confidence level. There's an upper confidence level. And like anything, you know, you uh -huh. get a bell curve there. You got your upper and your lower. We're ten percent above that. Ten percent below that. And you got your mean in the middle. Those are the numbers that, that we utilize okay. for these drainage. So that is our standard practice then. So a TD wouldn't blink an eye at the fact that we're using the X year, but the mean value. Yeah, I think there was some comments that TD wanted to understand where the rain data was happening. I didn't see that. Oh, or maybe that was just Clark and I working on them. Because we sent you the well, You sent me an email yeah. and I responded back and, and gave you. Um, I've I Every project I've done in this town, we've used the mean that mm -hmm. Cornell precipitation, or prior to that, the charts that are in the New York State Stormwater Design mm -hmm. Manual, which if you look at those, your guess is as good as mine. They're about this big, and they've got about four lines drawn across New York State, and you have to interpolate how far you are between mm -hmm. those lines. Um, not very accurate and not, not uh, great to work with, but that's what New York State DEC guideline, um, guidelines say to use absent other data. We're, we've been using the other data. I know New York State DEC is accepting it. I've had several slips um, reviewed by them and, and gone over uh, through their process in, in Region 1 and um, or in Region 4 and Region mm -hmm. 5. You know, I just want to pick up a point, maybe to amplify what Mr. Khan just said. I, I think we have, our challenge is we have some causal inevitability here. 
good chance going to have to overcome. We had some very informed speakers, each one remaining here, that have been very thorough and thoughtful about the presentations in the next storm that comes if this is developed. The conclusions will be drawn, and that will impact homeowners, you, and your practice. I think we're going to have to overcome a, a burden here because we have an impact the neighborhood. I just think we have to come to terms with that problem. And, and, and you know, we do understand that, and Unfortunately, that's an existing condition we're dealing with. Um, that's not something Mr. Pulsinelli has created, and nor is it anything he wants to exacerbate. However, and it is unfortunate that Mr. Pulsinelli has this land that, that is what it is, it doesn't seem reasonable to me that you'd use a mean in an example that's not average. You know, the, the land doesn't shed. It sheds water faster and better than any other area. You know, the, the mean might not be the... The metric that is is engineered to, I'm just I'm just thinking out loud and thinking about the feedback and and kind of you know on Mike's point, it's all it's going to fall back all on all on all of us you know in one way or another if it doesn't if there is a method to engineer beyond the mean without it being completely cost prohibitive um, might be worthy effort because it's an exceptional area it's not average. I will tell you, I did run the numbers off the higher frequency. The 7.44? The Actually, no, not the 7.44, because that's the extreme. Form. That's extreme. That's, that's the... 90th Irish. percentile, that's, I think. We no I ran everything up to that, the, t the 2, the 10, the, the 50. And based on my design, it worked. Okay. Um, and the... I actually had the design work on the mean for the 100 year, the extreme flood. The extreme flood is in your storm sewers in the town of Niskeyun are designed to be 10 year. Yeah. So what that means is you get something that exceeds the 10 year, you get the 25 year storm, you get four and a half, five inches of rain. In theory, all of the catch basins or the catch basins that are operating near capacity under the 10 year will be flooding and there will be water and it will cross the roads and the roads will be flooding. And that's, that's what's, um, you know, that, that's the reality. Some towns have bumped that up to the 25 year. Um, and, and I believe I actually, even in the town, I've even had to design some of the systems that the coming banner might be designed for the 25 year. For the storm sewer. Um, but that's the reality of the storm events. I'm trying to design the system to meet the 100 year. I'm trying to design the system to attenuate the flows to less than what's going through that storm system now as a benefit to the residences downstream and to try to make their situation not make it worse, make it better because they're going to get less runoff from this site at the end of the day. Unfortunately, Mr. Polsonelli is stuck paying the bill to, to, to do that. So we can only do so much. I mean, would would it be great if we could attenuate it and drip it off in a in a half inch pipe and put it into that system where hardly any goes out? Yeah, but it would render the site useless and render the development useless. We're trying to trying to work with the town, with the board, with the residents to to come up with a situation where Mr. Polsonelli can can you know basically build build the lots as you know is allowed by zoning and exceed the requirements of what would typically be required for a normal drainage analysis, which is meeting the existing condition under the mean, which is the way the New York State Stormwater Design Manual describes it, um, and then taking that and exceeding it even more, which is what we did in this last one, Mr. Khan had requested, and we went in, we added some stone. The issue, and I'm going to be very honest with you, the issue we are running into is we're looking at a three inch pipe. I don't want to go any mm -hmm. lower than a three inch pipe. If you go any lower than a three inch pipe, then you run into maintenance problems and they start to get clogged. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, you start looking at a three inch pipe and you're like, okay, well, then you start to get a little bit ahead on that three inch mm -hmm. pipe and you're pushing more and more water out. Of it. And so we're, we're kind of playing this game with adjusting the amount of area of stone, adjusting the, the, the shape of the stone, the, the, the shape of the basins, um, adjusting the elevation of that three inch pipe to try to get those flows for those defined storm events to be less than what we've identified as the existing condition. And, and I, I spent a lot of time working on that and adjusting that. 
I will tell you that that is, and, and I'm sure um, the resident who is very well spoken and, and very knowledgeable on the subject will tell you that is based on a 10 year, 24 hour type two storm or a 100 year. Okay. Nobody's going to go out there and say that was a 10 year, 24 hour type two storm. It's what we design around. Stormfall and stormfall intensities vary widely. So when we're talking about adjusting these things by newts, quarters of an inch in, in elevation and stuff, we're adjusting it to that design storm. Is the exact storm going to end up being the same? So what, what as engineers we're tasked to do is look at this and say, okay, well, is this going to work for pretty much every event? And you know, you start taking a look at the flows, you start taking a look at the, the peak runoff rates, and you get a grasp of how much runoff is going through that pipe and sizing the pipe appropriately so that, hey, you have some level of confidence that when you get that, you know, gully wash or thunderstorm where you get three inches of rain in you know, two hours in the summer, it worked. And that that's that's how, it, is there a design protocol to, to do that? No, but as an engineer, you kind of come up with the, the designs and, you know, your, your storage on top of that. So I, I guess all I'm trying to say is we are trying to work with this board and with the residents to come up with something that makes the situation better without breaking Mr. Polsonelli's bank uh, and certainly not exacerbating the situation. Well, Laura, is Matt going to be in that meeting too? Um, yeah, I think we do want to try and invite Matt. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I just, I mean, I know it's kind of been said but um, I am a certified floodplain manager, so I go to a fair amount of floodplain management storage, yeah. which is different than stormwater. But the reoccurring, uh, the reoccurring theme at the trainings that I keep going to is that um, floodwater data, rainwater data, yeah. it's all the mean for past storms because we have no crystal ball, right? right. Mm -hmm. But with crystal ball or no crystal ball, that we know that the intensity and frequency of storms is going up. So when Mr. Khan says, um, do that little extra bump, I mean, like the state of New York requires freeboard because if you're flooding and designing to the, you know, the 1% flood, it's just not good enough. Like they're saying, you, yeah. yeah, you got to design to the 1% flood and then you got to add two feet because we don't know what's going to happen. Right. And I think at some point it's probably even going to be three feet or four feet. Maybe just think about that because yeah. we know that this is all past data. So we want to make sure that as we're moving forward, that we're that we're continuing to understand that we've got to build that buffer into these things. I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, the one thing I will say is that freeboard is catastrophic failure prevention. Right. The, I'm telling flood, but, flood is different than storm. Right. But I'm just saying yeah. like in the context of knowing and saying I designed to the mean, the mean is acceptable. I mean, I think that you're going to see the state move forward to we've got to do a little bit more every time. We've got to do a little bit more. My, my recommendation to, to this board and to the town, if that's an avenue you would like to pursue, you yeah. You should. We should modify the code. You should modify the code. Yep. You should yep. take a look at how Colony has their code written, and modify the code because I will tell you that I've done numerous projects in this town, and never once has an applicant been mm. been tasked to do this. And it's it's tough for me to look at my client and say, "Hey, listen, everybody else did this, including the development next door. Everybody else did this, but you need to do this." And I understand this is. You know, it, 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 and, and I'm not saying that we're not going to look at these values and I'm not going to take a look at the design and what's best for this. I'm just saying that the best way to handle that is to have that written right in the code. Hey, listen, here's here's the numbers our engineers feel comfortable with for rainfall numbers and intensities. You know, I mean, I've had towns tell me they want to use a type three storm instead of a type two because it's more, yeah. you know. So. Again, though, we're not, I just want to emphasize this. The purpose of this board is to look at individual circumstances, right? As opposed to peanut butter spread across the whole town, changing the code. I get it. We have very, we have areas that are, we have many areas that are wet. We have some that are significantly wet, and 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 feel that ten-year storm as if it was a fifty-year storm. And this is one of those areas. 
in in and that, so it would come back to a board looking at an application and saying in the past, all the other Pulsinelli's that have developed successfully with the metrics of that time had approval made sense but now we're at a different time to Laura's point the stormwater frequency is higher etc cetera, etc cetera. so I'm just saying that even if it was a change we still have to look at this or any particular area that has such a history and and that's why we're doing a drainage study on this if Look, if this were two lot subdivision on Rosendale Road, I did one not that long ago at the circle. We didn't do a drainage study. None was required. So that's why we're doing a drainage study. We are trying to take it above what would typically be required in a drainage study. We're trying to design that in accordance. I know I need to work through some of the issues with the TDE. And in his concerns, and I actually would like to, to put our heads together to come up with what we feel is the best solution. And but I do think if I, I I do I feel very strongly if the town wants to continue with higher storm storm uh, rain rainfall data that than what would normally be required by DEC, then it should be written into the town code and you know we'll 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 look at this and, I, and like i said i did i did run the numbers up to the extreme once we got to the extreme we were actually hitting that emergency overflow which you would always typically hit when you're hitting the extreme flood and it did exceed the amount running off the site but that was in the 100 year storm event but the previous storm events which as uh mr uh, cole said which was uh, concerned about the and I, i'm going to try to get the the verbiage correct um, the higher frequency, high intensity rainfall events on this stormwater runoff, not the longer duration, high rainfall storm events. So that, that's what I'm focusing on and looking at in, you know, as suggested by prime engineer. And you're saying basically, if we want to up the standards, we need to do it the right way. That that would be that would be my suggestion. At, at, from from my standpoint as an engineer, that's the cleanest, easiest way. You know, you know what you're designing to. You know what you're getting into. You know, I think that there's a lot of things that I think can can be written in there. Um, you know, I, I think I think the town has a a good um, has good language in there saying if there's a historical issue, we are going to require a drainage report. But that can be vague in and of itself. So I think, you know, moving forward, I think if you have something that's written, listen, you you, you disturb, you clear this many trees, whatever, we want a drainage report. And these are the numbers you use based upon our, our the value and the data that we've we've assessed for the town. Yeah, and maybe to be consistent. To be yeah, and maybe Laura, we do leave a either we put in something that's tabular or we leave it up to and or we leave it up to the discretion of the planning board to the point Mr. Flom was making, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, we can discuss code changes. Um, yep. at another. I think the code is strong enough right now because it identifies downstream drainage issues. And, and you know, if there's existing downstream drainage issues, like, I mean, we can require mitigation of the culverts that are causing mm -hmm. the downstream, you know, there's a lot of things that can be done if we have an existing problem and that we know. And I understand that the last person to the table, it can be expensive and frustrating. That is what it is. And our code is written that way, I think, because of that. But I, I actually, before you even said that, I wrote down, go look at the town of Colony's code to myself. But I, I do think that the code is strong enough right now for us to be exploring this issue. And as a good neighbor, to be double checking and looking at you know the 7.4, I mean, really knowing that we're getting it right because we tried with Vincenzo and we talked about this a little bit before, but I don't think that's working potentially as good as we really wanted it to, or at least it certainly wasn't, um, you know, Young when it was being built. I mean, we yeah. talked about that before. I mean, maybe it, I haven't heard too many comments on it now, but um, it definitely had some problems. There was definitely a lot of water running down the Vincenzo stub during those short duration storms. So we just want to do better. That didn't do quite as good as we wanted to do. Let's keep trying and doing better. Since you brought it up, Laura, Vincenzo, um, is, are both driveways paved? On Vincenzo, yes. Uh -huh. 
They are both good. Okay. Yeah. I think I think the last I heard during construction, there was some runoff issues. Um, I'm not surprised. Well, there were then, yeah. I, yeah. I'm not surprised. I haven't heard of anything post-construction since everything's in the basin did go in last because it was a bioretention basin and was required to go in last to, to meet the infiltration and the, the, the um, best practice requirements for construction of that. Yeah. So... Laura, should we actively ask some of the residents downstream from Vincenzo, at least in the post build after the installation of the bio, if they've seen or I mean, the felt. residents have actually come and met with us. And, and I mean, they definitely have discussed similar con concerns to what they talked about at the um, underprivilege of the floor. I do think that some of the fear is from the short storm, high intensity, um, which can overwhelm that area way faster than um, than a lot of the, the different types of storms. So keeping in mind the long duration storms and the short duration high intensity storms, I think is really important. It, it, is, a, it is a small, quick drainage shed based upon the soil conditions and the size of the drainage shed. It's not that large in comparison to some other drainage sheds in the area. And I, it does get that high intensity. You get it, you get a good hard rainfall. The water gets from the top of that drainage shed to that culvert on Raw Road pretty quickly, and you know that's and that decreases your times of concentration. And that's you know with what we're trying to do with the attenuation basins is just stretch that time of concentration out from, uh -huh. from our site. So, which is 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 the the process of, of any drainage study. So that's a good idea. And, and we, we will we'll look at those numbers. I, I, I again, I do caution the hundred year storm event is an extreme storm event. I, I'm happy to, to you know look at all of the, the numbers up to that. Um, the hundred year storm event that's in, in the 90th percentile. Um, I don't know. Yeah, we probably, well, I don't know if we saw that in Hurricane Irene or not. 7.44 inches in 24 hours because it was kind of a longer duration. Um, be hard, hard to tell. I'd have to go back and look at the data. But it was, you know, that, that that's what you're looking at when you're talking about that amount of rain. So. Okay, so um, one of the challenges, we don't, it's a short turnaround, two-week turnaround between next meeting. It sounds like we got a couple of meetings we got to squeeze in there. So. Yeah, I, I would like to try to get that meeting scheduled. I'm unavailable Wednesday. I have to be on DOT inspections on Wednesday. Um, tomorrow morning, first thing, I'm unavailable. Thursday and Friday is looking pretty good. So if, Yeah, I think Doug said he couldn't do Monday, <coughs> Tuesday, but Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Yeah, I'm a, unavailable on Wednesday, unfortunately. Okay, so. so maybe Thursday or Friday. Thursday or Friday would be excellent if we could get that squeezed in. Yeah, we just got to find out from Doug. So. Fantastic. All right. Great. Well, thank right. you. Thanks. Thank you very much. That's appreciate good your discussion. Guidance. We See appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Some meetings coming up. All right, that's it for discussion items tonight. Under reports, we just have... Uh, uh, 757 Union Street facade upgrades um, that were included in the packet. I think this is just informational only, right, Laura? I think we, you know, basically they're painting the trim on the Bank of America. We previously approved the signage there. I believe we had a waiver because there was some extra signage on the canopy for the drive through. So it looks like they're just going to paint the trim white, right, Laura? Yeah. So um, we did let them know that you guys would be looking at it tonight. If, there, if you have any comments or concerns, we can bring it back to them. But, um, Clark, here's the existing facade. Here's the new. You guys already pr approved the signage. Um, so really, it's literally just painting the, the trim white. And um, it looked fine to me. Yep. It looks very bright to me. I think, uh, yeah, Clark's concerned. We weren't, wasn't sure. You know, it's not in the town center overlay district. It looks like they're cleaning it up and they're painting it. So looks good. Yeah. And I feel like it matches the sign. Yep. Yeah. Great. You can give them the feedback so they can go ahead and finish up. All right. Anything else under reports? Um, I will be sending you guys an email. The June, the second meeting in June does have to be canceled of the planning board because of early voting. So I'll send you the updated schedule. Um, we'll only have one meeting in June. This is voting for which election, Laura? Early voting primaries, probably. Yes, okay. primaries. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the second meeting in June. I'll be sending you guys a revised calendar, but I just figured I'd give you a heads up before I sent it's it. It's going to be canceled, you said? It's going to be canceled. There's actually no way to reschedule it because of holidays. You would have to have two meetings back to back, like within a week apart. So we're just going to have one meeting in June. Okay. All right. Sounds, sounds good. Yeah. All right. Any questions or comments under commission business at all? I have none. No. Okay, motion to adjourn. So Move for adjournment by Mr. Scraby Tennis. I have a second. Second. Seconded by Mr. DRPNO. All those in favor of adjournment, signify by saying aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Chairman Walsh. <laughs>